Amen. Good morning, church. I said, good morning, church. How many know God is good? All the time and all the time, God is good. So I don't know how you came in this morning, whether you were a little under the weather or maybe a little down or maybe you're just so fired up. It's okay because God is good all the time. You know, uh, today has been such a, a great service thus far. Uh, I'm just super grateful to, to see God moving in the Metro Heights ministry in the region here. Uh, what an incredible restoration we had this morning with our brother Omar, who, is, who has definitely shown his repentance through his deeds. And bro, welcome back to the family. Welcome back to the good, good fight. Amen. And I know that when he said that vow this morning, he did not take that vow lightly. And I know John Causey got in there with him and challenged him and said, hey, don't even think about studying the Bible again unless you know you will never fall away again. And that brother right there made that vow this morning. So let's get that brother a hand right there. Amen. You know, I'm just super inspired by the word of God. I hope you're inspired this morning because the word of God is it's always perfect. The Bible says that the word of God is flawless. And no matter where you're at in life, the word of God has the solution and has the medicine. You know, something on my heart this morning that I want to talk about is blessings. And I believe that sometimes we don't talk enough about the blessings of God. You know, we could talk a lot about, you know, you know sharing our faith and, and making disciples, which we need to talk about, Amen. But sometimes we can just forget the blessings of God in the midst of it. Turn with me, if you will, in your Holy Scriptures to Psalms, Psalm 115. We're going to talk about blessings this morning. Now, I'm not talking about no prosperity gospel. I just want to talk about the blessings of the Scriptures, amen? Amen. In Psalm 115. We're going to pick it up in verse 12. The Bible reads, it says, The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Metro Heights. He will bless the house of Aaron. Oh, I'm going to claim that right there. Amen. He will bless those who fear the Lord small and great alike. May the Lord make you increase both you and your children. You know, I love this, this passage because what it, it tells us is that God remembers you. You know, sometimes I think we can think that God forgets us, that God forgets all the things that we have done for him in our Christianity. We can think, man, God, I poured out so, so much for you, but I don't think you're going to remember me. But right here, the Bible says the Lord remembers us, and he will bless us. But the thing is, is as disciples, sometimes we just don't claim those promises. Sometimes we just don't claim those blessings. But in verse 14, it says, may the Lord make you increase. You see, we got to seek the blessings of God. We got to claim the increases in our relationship. And so today, guys, that my title is simply claim your blessings. Point number one, name it and claim it. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Name it and claim it. Second Corinthians chapter two. Verse eight. In verse twenty. It says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. You know, the first thing that we notice right here is that these 
are, are, are promises of God. And yet we have to understand that Paul, as he's speaking to the church, he says no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ Jesus. You know, when the scriptures are yes in Christ Jesus, when the scriptures show you what blessings that you may receive and what blessings that you may actually ask God to give you, they will always be yes. But the scripture that I really wanted to look at was in chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 9. I kind of got a little ahead of myself right there, amen? It was actually 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But that was the scripture that was involved right there, amen, for the promises of God. But in chapter 9, you know, this is a scripture in which we always look at when we're, when we're giving to God and the heart in which we give to God. And we're going to look at verse 8. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is always overflowing in many expressions of God, thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, the hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. You know, in verse 8, Paul describes how the grace of God will abound. That it will increase. And I have to remind us this morning that, you know, when Special Missions was around, Metro Heights, we gave over $132,000. Go ahead, clap it up to God for that. Amen. But right here, we understand that God says that, man, when you give like that, when you, when you give with all your heart, there is, sow, there is seed to sow. There was a harvest of righteousness to sow. There was blessings to sow. And God promises rewards. So don't feel bad when you go to God saying, hey, God, man, I, I really sacrificed this special mission. Man, God, I really sacrificed in this area of my walk with God. Please just open up the floodgates and bless me. Do not be afraid to do that. Because the principle remains the same, that if you give to God with a great heart, he will always give you a reward. Amen. And, you know, some of the things that God can reward us in is maybe finances, maybe materially, materialistically. Um, even he might just reward you spiritually. He might give you that great job promotion. He might just drop you some nuggets in your quiet times. As you're reading the word of God, he said, you know what? I see your heart. Let me go ahead and just open up your mind like he did with his disciples right there to explain the scriptures. And let me just drop a little wisdom on you right there. Let me give you some nuggets right there. And that you receive that and it just enriches your spirituality. See, God is waiting. God is waiting for you to claim your blessings. But what are you waiting for? You know, in verse 10, it says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and would enlarge your harvest of righteousness. How many in here want to be righteous before God? If you want to be righteous before God, you better claim your blessing. You know, in verse 11, he goes on and talks about how we will be made rich in every way 
that you can be generous on every occasion. See, God wants to bless you so then you can actually bless other people. So that you may be spiritually enriched with one another. But you know why we don't claim our blessings? It's because sadly sometimes we have a slave mentality. We have a slave mentality. And what, what, do, I, what, what do you mean by that? And what I mean is that you think that you're a slave and therefore you cannot ask God for anything. Because slaves don't receive anything from their masters. And yet they don't expect anything. But the Bible says and confirms that we are children of God. So if you are a child of God, guess what? You can actually expect an increase in your life. You can actually expect great things for God in your life. Because you know what? Children actually expect things. You know, I'm sure baby Grace expects a whole lot from Michael and Jasmine. She doesn't mind crying until she gets what she wants. And some of, some of those that are in, in the audience today who have children, I'm pretty sure your kids bug you for a lot of things. Because they know that they can expect it from you. You know, I think about the rich young ruler in Mark 10, where Jesus confronts this rich young ruler about giving up everything to follow him. And in the, in the midst of it, his disciples kind of feel like, man, if this, this guy who seems so righteous and seems so perfect because he lived by the law, how, if he can't be saved, how can we be saved? And the disciples are, are shaking in their boots. They're like, man, I know I'm messed up. So I don't know if I'm going to make it, Jesus. But Jesus encouraged them and he says, hey, if you are willing to give up anything for the gospel, you will not fail to receive a hundred times as much. But do you believe that this morning? That if you know that you have given up everything to follow Jesus, that you have a hundred times much coming back to you. Turn me to Psalm chapter 5. In Psalm chapter 5, verse 3, this is David right here, and he says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait in expectation. You know what I love is that David, he says, in the morning. And you know what, and I looked this up, you know, in the Hebrew, because I wanted to know what morning was like during that time. And the Hebrew actually suggests that it was actually, you know, before the sun comes up. The rise of dawn. So I was like, man, David right here, he made sure to get up early in the morning before the sun came up because he, he has so many things on his heart that he was expecting from God. And there were so many things that he wanted to go before God and get on his knees and just send them up saying, God, I am waiting in expectation. And yet we forget and fail to realize that God is a listener. Because it says God is so attentive to him. He says, you hear my voice, God. You hear it. I know you hear it. See, God is always listening. He is waiting for you to come with him with request. You know what I love about God is that God hears your complaints. You know, God hears when, when you're getting open about your sin. He hears your doubts. He hears your requests. He hears your love for him. And yet the very thing that he loves hearing is your heart. But David got up and had some great quiet times in the morning because he knew that he can get up and expect some things from him. You know, when I think of expectation, uh, you know, I think of, man, like waking up 
um, in the morning when my parents said, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland the next day. And you know, as a kid, you can't sleep when you know you're going somewhere exciting. And, and I just expected to get up and to get ready and to jump in that car full speed and be the first one in there because I expected to go to Disneyland because that's what my parents said we were going to do. And in the same way, there's so many things that God says throughout his scriptures that help us to understand how it's okay to expect great things from God. But what I love is that it says, wait in expectation. You know, in the Hebrew, to wait in expectation means to keep watch, to peer into the distance, to await, to wait for. That's what it means to wait in expectation. And I believe that as disciples, we need to pray in expectation. We can't pray hopeful prayers. I think there's too many of us that get on our knees and say, God, I hope that you can do this for me. God, I hope that you can provide this for me in my life. No, God says to come with him with expectation. You're expecting, you're already receiving the blessing. You know, when I think of expectations, and, and, and waiting for them and, 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 and requesting those expectations, I think about my grandfather, my abuelo. And I remember growing up as a child that uh, every Friday was payday. My grandfather used to always leave me $3, exactly $3, on his nightstand. And he, and he used to call me Brakowski, which I think means brat, and I don't even know what language, because um, I was a brat growing up, so that's what he used to call me was Brakowski. And... Um, Every Friday, I would come over there with expectation, knowing that I was going to receive those $3. And without fail, my grandfather always had the $3 there. So the reason why I expected it to be there was because he was so reliable to begin with. That I trusted that when my grandfather said there was going to be $3 on that nightstand on Friday and it was payday, that I was going to get paid. But, you know, we need to ask, wait, and expect. You know, if you take the first letters of ask, wait, and expect, what do you get? All. A-W-E. If you ask, wait, and expect, you will be in awe of what God will do in your life. You know, in Mark 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. When you realize in prayer that God is going to answer that with your expectation there, he will give it to you if it's according to his will. And I want to challenge us this morning. I want to challenge us to name it and claim it. I want to challenge us to to, this is what our brother Aleem challenged us with at Devo when we were, we were doing about, uh, talking about prayer. And he challenged the group, and I want to give it to you guys, on writing out what you're expecting God to do in your life. Go ahead and just take out a piece of paper and just, man, even if it's a hundred things, go ahead and write it out. Because you're going to see God complete many of those things on that sheet. But only if you name it and you claim it. But in order to claim the blessings from God, you also must claim the promises of God. Toward me, point number two is claim the promises of God. You know, God is totally trustworthy, right? So we know that when God gives you a promise, it's not a 90% chance that it'll happen. It's not a 95% chance that it'll happen. But it's a 100% chance that it'll happen because God is reliable, amen? amen. But you know what, what? What is a promise? A promise is an assured thing that one will do. You know, in the Bible, there's been some people that have tried to count the promises of God. And it's crazy because there's so many promises. You know, some people think there's about 3,000 promises in the word of God. Some think that there's 8,000 promises in the word of God. But the point is, is that there's so many promises in the word of God that we can solely rely on those promises. 
But the one thing that we cannot forget is that God's promises are conditional. God's promises are based off of your obedience in your walk with him. See, sometimes we think like, oh, man, God's, God has some great promises for me. And you just walk around and don't apply the scriptures to your life. Don't apply the promises to your life. Don't believe in the promises in your life. And then you expect for those promises to come true. But those promises are conditional. But why does God choose to give you and me promises? That's the big question. God, why? Why would you choose us to receive these promises? Well, one is that God wants you to learn something about his character. He wants you to know how faithful he is. He wants you to know how patient he is. He wants you to know how forgiving and kind he is. He gives us these promises so that we may learn the deeper truths of his nature. But also God gives us these promises so that we may lean on them and find strength and hope in as well. You know, when I think of a promise, I think of a direct deposit. How many guys get paid? Praise God. But you know, when payday comes around, Guess what? You know for a fact because you work for your employer and they said that every single week or every two weeks or every month, whatever time you get paid, it's going to show up in your account with a direct deposit. Or maybe you're old school and you just receive that check and you say, hey, I'm going to go cash this in and I know the money's going to be there. But that is like God and his promises. You only need to cash them in, amen? But in order to claim God's promises, you have to actually know God's promises. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 1. In Nehemiah chapter 1, you have to know God's promises. And so Nehemiah, who is a cupbearer of the king of Persia, He hears the devastation of Jerusalem. He sees how his his people are suffering and his city is in shambles. And he is so broken by the immense tragedy that has happened in his kingdom. And we're going to look at what Nehemiah does when he goes to God with a promise that he made. In verse 8, Nehemiah says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then if you if your exiled people are at the farther horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength. In your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this. You know, Nehemiah, the only way that he was able to claim this promise from God was that. He went to him and he said, remember the instruction in which you gave your servant Moses. So one, in order for Nehemiah to remind God about his promises, he first had to know the promises. You know, I'm I'm a little afraid to ask some people in in these pews, what is some some of God's promises in his word? And I'm, I'm afraid that Maybe some of you guys might be able to rattle just one promise. Oh, come on. I'm afraid that some of you might be able to rattle off two promises. Come on. But we just learned that there's a couple thousand promises in the word of God oh, right come there. On, come on. But if you are going to believe his promises yeah. and receive those promises, you have to know the promises. Come on, come on. You see, you can't claim something you don't know. So if you don't know the promises, you cannot claim it. Come on. And therefore, you can't get better at God. 
But the, but the other thing that we see here is that God is reminded of his promise, right? Nehemiah says, remember the instruction you gave to Moses. You know, and, and I like this because when you read such a promise, you have to understand that you can take that back to the great promiser. And it's not that God needs to be reminded, but it's that you need to be reminded. And it's there to, to, to show us that, man, you can take this, take this to the throne of God and request it. Come on. Because God is not a liar. But some of us might think like, man, Aaron, you know, that, that just seems prideful. That just seems prideful to, to just ask in that way. Well, you got to ask in an in a, in a honorable way, amen. amen. You got to ask in a respectable way. You don't go up to God entitled, but you go before him and like plead, God, you are a God who always comes through. You are God, when you say something, I know it's going to happen. I remember in Nehemiah chapter 1, blah, 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 blah. God's going to be like, oh, you know, you know my promises? Okay, right. amen. Come on. Bam! Ha. There's your blessing. Come on. Come on. Right. Yeah. You know, how, how, how can we be assured of this? Well, in John 14... Verse 12 through 14, Jesus says something pretty remarkable. He, say, he talks about how if you live like he lived and you believe in him and do what, what, he was be, what he was doing, you will do even greater things. But in verse 14, he says, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So Jesus actually says to ask him. He does, so, so we have to remove the, the mentality that it's a prideful thing to ask God to come through with his promises. But once you remind God of his promise, what then must you do? Or what then will happen? You will see God's promises come true in your life. Come on, brother. So when you know the promises and you actually talk about reminding God of his promises, you will eventually see his promises be fulfilled. Yeah, come on. And I believe that when you feel as though those promises aren't fulfilled, it's probably because you just don't believe in them. Mm. But Nehemiah, he goes before the king, and, he, and he's sad. And the king knows that he's sad. And the king asks him, he says, hey, why are you sad? Why are you downcast? And Nehemiah explains to him why. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2 to see what happens when you know the promises of God. In verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judea, where my fathers are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take? And when, you, when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Aspa, keeper of the king's force, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted me my request. Is that not powerful? Yeah. To know that when Nehemiah followed this, 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 this order of knowing the promises, that he was able to see it be fulfilled right before his eyes. And you know what? I'm sure that as Nehemiah saw this promise, it refreshed him. I'm, sur I'm sure that when Nehemiah saw this promise, it, it, it activated some faith, more faith in his relationship with God. You know, when the Bible challenges you on these promises, are we going to receive it? Mm, come on. 
You know, maybe, maybe you're feeling weak spiritually. Guess what? There's a promise for you in the Bible. Maybe you're thirsting to draw near to God. Guess what? There's a promise in the Bible for you. You know, I want to challenge us this morning to find in the Bible some promises that you want to see happen in your life. Maybe that's a promise of fruitfulness, a promise of increase, a promise of guidance, a promise of God's love. Whatever it is, pray through that promise. In closing, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Thank you, my sister. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in the accordance with his pleasure and will. You know, Paul right here, he says how there is a flood of blessings that are waiting for each and every one of us. That there are spiritual blessings that are going to enrich our lives spiritually. But with every spiritual blessing... We have to do what we talked about today, which is first you got to name it and you got to claim it. But secondly, secondly, not only do you name it and claim it, but you got to claim the promises of God so that you may receive the blessings of God. And I believe that if we do those things, if we obey the Bible, if we believe the scriptures this morning, you will see an abundant harvest in your life. I love you.